Is that true that you asked David Heyman why he didn't include Dumbledore's funeral in the Half Red Prince movie? Hello everyone, welcome to the Rowling Library. I am Patricio and today I have the great honor of being with Ivana Lynch. You of course know her from playing Luna Lovegood in the Harry Potter films, but she's also an activist and book author. Uh, today we are going to talk about her new book, this one, uh, The Opposite of Butterfly Hunting. This book mm -hmm. is her first book, hopefully not her last book, and it's her, it's her memoir about growing up, uh, becoming a woman and balancing mental health with creativity. Uh, it's a great book. I, I have read it, of course. Uh, I highly recommend it. it. It has all the ingredients to be a great memoir. Uh, it's engaging. It's addictive for me. Uh, I read it, I think, in two days. It's well written. Uh, it has some shocking moments, but with sometimes funny moments, it has a mixture of things. Uh, yeah, so we are going to talk about this book today and everyone experience in the in the Harry Potter films as well that are of course included in, in this in this great book. So let's get this started. Ivana, welcome. Thank you very much for your time. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you for reading the book as well. I know it's a bit of a rough read at times, so <laughs> I really appreciate you making the time. No, it was a pleasure, honestly. It's it's, it's a great read. Uh, I, I enjoy it. I, I know it's not a happy book, if you want to put it like that, but for the reader, it's engaging. So thank you for, for writing and sharing your experience with, with everyone. Uh, I, I like to start from the beginning, from the origin of this book. Uh, how, different, how different is this book, the one we have in our hands now, with the book that you imagine the, the first time the, the idea came to, to, to you? It, it, it evolved over time, it changed a lot. That's a good question, actually. Um, I think probably before I wrote, I've known I needed to write this for many years. I've been talking about this topic and not really fully getting my point across. So I, I know I, I knew I had to write it, but I, I didn't see it as a memoir, I suppose. I saw it as First, I thought maybe self-help because I read a lot of like psychology, self-help books. Um, and I thought, yeah, I'll write something that's, you know, for everyone. But then um, as I wrote it, I was like, I actually don't really, I don't really get a lot from self-help books. I get much more from stories than I do from um, sort of prescriptive things as in I want to feel and peer into somebody else's world and how they felt and how they dealt with things. And that's what changes me. So um, I think I had a lot of uh, just embarrassment or an awkward feeling of like, really, I'm gonna write a book of myself at the ripe old age of, 20, of 28, you know? The whole thing with memoir, I thought, oh, is this just too narcissistic? Um, so I had to get over that first, that that judgment of, of the memoir, memoirs was genre and realize that, oh, I've been changed by memoirs and I love personal storytelling. I love really getting to know the, the real vulnerable kind of uh, unpalatable sides of humanity. So, um, yeah, once I got over that and, and realized that's what I wanted to write, it was it was fairly straightforward and um, uh yeah and then i did tell the stories as i wanted to tell them like th these things have been in my head for years of the places i went the, the doctors who treated me and i just was like i have a lot of thoughts that i want to get down on paper and and so having finished the book i really felt like yeah it's not a perfect book but that's exactly how i wanted to say it there's nothing more i can add to that story and i think for so many years i've been really struggling to articulate what i meant and this book felt like cool i i've done that and i can put that story to rest yeah yes i, I was going to ask you later but you 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 said it now it, it doesn't read like a memoir it's more like a novel in, in the way you <laughs> yeah. structure the book so that that's what kind of purpose, right? You, you did it because you didn't want to read like a self-help book, but more like a story, something like more engaging. Yeah, I love, I just love stories. And I, that's how I see the world. That's how I understand the world. Like when I meet people, I like, I find 
I'm fascinated by the little eccentric details about them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to get get stuck into humanity. I suppose I probably write like an actor with, you know, the emotions are what guide me. There's, they were sort of the, the dots between each experiences. And it was just a matter of joining the dots, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and I just, I want it to be entertaining. This is not supposed to be, I'm not, I don't want to inflict this on, you know, it's not supposed to be just a misery memoir of, oh, poor me, here's all the things. It's meant to be a series of stories and the moments of realization and, and what helps me and who helps me. And um, yeah, as I say, I, I think I just have this profound belief that we are changed by storytelling, um, that they reach into some childlike, deep unconscious place, you know, like our, our heart center really, and affect us in a way that, um, yeah, other books don't, you know, theoretical or, yeah, um, prescriptive self-help books. I, I, I've, all, I've been, I mean, for Harry Potter is the prime example that shaped me and changed me and lit me up in a way nothing else could. Um, and it also extends to other things like my animal rights activism. I think they, that my interest in animal rights really started with films like Charlotte's Web or Babe or Chicken Run films and books that were just stories. They weren't saying, here's the right way, here's the wrong way. This is a judgment on humankind. It was just presenting uh, an individual narrative. So I, that, yeah, it's like a philosophy I have that storytelling changes us. So that's why I had to. Yeah, I think it's a good one. It's a good one, a good philosophy to have. Uh, you, you mentioned this is like a story, but your story is not complete. So right in the ending of the book, how did you approach that? That was difficult, yeah. Um, knowing where to end um because of course i want it to be i wanted it to be uplifting you know i mm -hmm. want people to i want people to come away with a feeling of like you know ins inspiration yes. that i, I think you did it I, I felt that when i read the ending so i think you did it that's really nice thank you yeah like i want people to have sort of the courage to really pursue their dreams and and to to really put that negative toxic self-talk to mm -hmm. bed to get rid of that so that that was the intention but of course you know i'm human and as you say my life is a life it's not a story and it, it's it's hard to just end and be like oh, i i'm you know I, i'm good now i've conquered that self-hate it's gone away <laughs> you know i think and that's why the last chapter is very honest i think i have I think I manage the self-hate. It's not gone. I don't think it will ever, or or even just maybe not self-hate, but negativity. That will always be very tempting to me to follow those negative voices. That will always be a seductive choice. But I have much more awareness now. And I and I also just, you know, I really believe in dreaming. I believe in creativity, I believe in self-expression over self-destruction. So it's like those are the choices that I, I make now, I consciously make. Um, but you know, in a way, the book could have gone on and on. Like, there's been many moments since the book where I'm like, oh, I should have put that in there. Or, oh, I, I'm, I'm maybe not practicing the messages of the book as much as I should do. Um, but it, that, like, that's a book, isn't it? You have to yeah. find the little stories, the little narratives within, and you have to find it. Um, so it's as honest I, as I could be whilst turn, you know, giving an ending to the book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And... Um and going back to this idea of never ending, uh, in the in the book you say many times the recovery process it's ongoing for you. Like mm -hmm. the negative yeah. negativity never leaves. Writing this book, sharing the experience was part of this recovery process for you. Expressing your ideas, put your creativity into this book, or you take it as something yeah. separated. No, absolutely. And I actually would say, I know people say recovery is ongoing, but I think my recovery journey is done. I okay. think, yeah, I really do. And I, I think, I'll, you know, there's other iterations of that voice, like the negative self-talk, the addiction to negative thinking, that will continue. But my recovery from my eating disorder is complete. Okay. Uh, like, you live with those memories and, and it shaped me, but I don't, I think that's done. And I actually think the book was the last piece of recovery, which I didn't realize. I thought I'd recovered fully years before, but um, it, there was a sense that a lot of this book was written from the perspective of an 11 year old child. 
with the hindsight of um you know being an adult and having the vocab and having the um understanding that that adults do so uh, um but it, but it was like that that young me who was struggling with mental health and just a lot you know this eating disorder depression all that stuff um I was very angry with how my treatment was handled, with how my mental health was dealt with. Uh, and it was like, because it was framed as true, you know, there were things that were done, and as I go into in detail in the book, there were things that were done really well. You know, I had the best parents in the world. I had an amazing therapist, but there were things that were mishandled, like the treatment center I went to. And I think the book was that... 11 year old finally getting the chance to say here are all my thoughts on what happened here's what was good here's what i wish had been done different and here's what i wish people will do differently for other people in my position in future and i really feel such a sense of of peace since writing the book like i don't feel um i feel like my i i looked after my younger self in a way that she hadn't been looked after before and um you know, all that stuff, like, like I say, recovery from anorexia in particular is, is difficult because you do have a lot of grief and you do have a lot of regret for recovering. And it was almost like I felt ashamed for, for years of, and I was sort of talking about recovery and no, it's this great thing, but I also felt ashamed about it. And I think writing this book and just like claiming that story and saying, yes, I went through that. And yes, I recovered. It, it just gave me, um, yeah a sense of peace and completion that i hadn't had before so in some ways the book was entirely for me to heal like that's how it was written and i hope it heals other people too but yeah i feel i feel very healed from writing it no i i agree with you i think the the main goal of the book should be for you first and then for the readers right it's it's like an advice to every writer as well like write for you for yourself what you like what makes you feel better and then let it for the readers uh I noticed the the book is very honest, very crude. Uh, were you tempted to tone it down while you were writing it, or never? No, not at all. No, because like Patricia, like I've read so many eating disorder books. I read them during my eating disorder and after, where it's just like I see. I'm like, am I allowed to swear on this? I cannot. If you, am I yeah, yes, swear? you can. You can. You can. You can. Like I'll read, not all of them, but a lot, some of them I'll read, I'm like, there's, there's, you know, glimmers of honesty in there, but a lot of it is bullshit. Like, I'm like, I'm sorry, this is not, I, I think I just found that a lot of, so, so the eating disorder voice is extremely toxic, extremely negative. And then to kind of read books that were like, I, uh, you know, I've learned to love myself. I'm like, I don't buy that. You can't have struggled with that much level of toxicity and self-hate that you actually starved yourself, that you actually almost killed yourself. You can't struggle with that and then snap into self-love. And that was always the, the disjoint in, in, the, in, in those kind of memoirs for me was that like, oh, we went through the whole um, you being you kind of undoing yourself, destroying yourself. We went through that gritty, awful, miserable part. And then we went through physical recovery and now somehow, somewhere in between, you've learned to love yourself. I just didn't buy it. So I felt like, look, if I'm going to write this book, if I'm going to really write about sort of attaining a level of self-acceptance and appreciation for my body, I have to be given permission to write fully about the voice of self-hate because I, and it's not just for, I wanted to get those things out of me or I wanted to have a moan, have a rant, you know, there's spaces for having a rant, but I don't think it's in books. I, I think you have to be conscious of the readers and who's reading it. So my intention was I'm going to go all into this darkness, be really honest so that people who are going through it as well will feel um, understood, will feel seen, uh, will not feel so alienated. And then they can talk about these things and free themselves. And then they can find the tools for healing because, you know, like it's the cliche, but like, as soon as you expose darkness to light, it's not so scary anymore. It's not, it's not impenetrable. It's not uh, impossible to, to understand it, it's, you see it clearly for what it is and then you can heal it. So that was the intention. And I just feel like it's kind of, I say in the foreword of the book that a lot of 
books dealing with this topic are too tentative because they don't want to be triggering or they don't want to be uh, spread negativity. And I just don't think that's the way through. I, I fully appreciate, you know, their, their conscientiousness, but I think the way I say in the book, the only way out is through. I think the way to heal these dark parts of ourselves and to deal with them is to fully look at them, put them out there, and then talk about them together. So, yeah, I had no, um, I never, I, I had no doubts of being on. There were definitely times where it was like, I had to be a little more conscious, tone th things down, but that was my editors. They kind of said, mm -hmm. your disorder voice is maybe running away with itself here. You're being a bit mean here. And I would see that as well. So it, it was softened slightly, but it kept its, mm -hmm. its edge. Um, and I was actually very inspired by a memoir called, uh, um, there's a few memories of mine. It's called um, How to Murder Your Life by Kat Marnell. And she talks, she uh, had a, she was a serious drug addict she might still be I actually don't know her book is interesting in that it doesn't wrap it up tidily but again it was just like she's so honest about the toxic thoughts but also the highs it gives you the comfort it gives you it's like laugh out loud shocking funny non-fiction and uh and and that and it changed me it was like great this is who i am i'm this kind of absolute chaotic mess that she is and i i feel i feel seen from it so yeah sorry long answer but yeah that's no that's... no that's great I, I i when i was reading i, I think the honesty that you include in the book uh, allowed me to see the real you right uh, no makeups mm -hmm. no, nothing that there is no wall between the reader and the author and your experiences so uh, i really appreciate that but i kept wondering through, through the reading did you have to like um i don't know uh, combine your parents your dad and your mom about including some bits about them or they accept everything because th there is a, a a friction in our relationship which i think it's part of everyone almost every teenager every kid has that kind of relationship but it's not a uh, public most of the time right it's something we hide but but, but i appreciate you you make it public and you share it in your book but i wonder if they were mm -hmm. not happy or they ask you to not to not include them yeah, so that question you just asked me was the question that hung over me all through writing the book. Um, because yeah, I, sh I, I go, I mean, my relationship with my mom, especially, mm -hmm. that was such a big part of the book. I, I couldn't tell the story without going into detail mm -hmm. about that. And and I think there's something, you know, there's some wisdom in that of, of like the ancestral wounds that we carry down through generation. You know, my mom's sense of inferiority and not being enough and her mother's and her mother's all that was passed on. So I thought that was interesting. Um, um, but so when I first wrote the book, I would kind of I wrote, I wrote it as if like nobody's going to read it and everyone's going to be fine with it. I didn't try to consciously. But um, but again, wanted to be honest. Um, also, I wanted to it was important to include them to show a family who did everything, you know, parents who did everything for their daughter, their child. And still I had issues like there was no there was nothing. There was no clear thing to put my problems to attribute them to it was not like oh you were neglected here or, oh, on this day you're you were abandoned it was not that so um i had to show that um but no i wrote it all down all the ugly truth i sent it to my mom first because i was like if my mom has a lot of changes then this is going to be an entirely different book and i was praying i was just like i don't know how i write this without her um so yeah i put her through that first and um she was amazing like i was because i'm very hard on my mom at certain points like mm -hmm. i i really go for it and um you you know but it's from that that who i was then who, who yes. i was struggling i also have a lot of love for her you know i love my parents so much so i hope that, that i think that's in there too but yeah i gave it to her to read and I was like just prepared. We had a big Skype session. I was so nervous. I was just like, because it's just the thing was like, I'm so honest in this book, but I've never had these conversations with my parents, my my family. You kind of when you go through those sort of very difficult times, you move on. You don't want to talk about it. You kind of be like that stuff. Let's not talk about that because that was upsetting, and we're we're moving on now. We're taking so forth. So we never talked about any of this stuff since I was. 11 12 13 and then to suddenly be on it was over zoom and to be on and i literally was like she's gonna give me all these notes don't say this but me don't say this she didn't give me one note about her 
And I just thought that was such an incredible act of generosity and grace and bravery. Cause you know, it's not, she didn't choose to bear, bear all in this book, but she let me. The only thing she was, she was doing the typical mom thing. She was like looking out for my sisters. She was like, can you not say this about Maria and Emily? And she also said, can you check with them if they're okay with this? And she did have, I think she had several nightmares about there was this one neighbor that I like wrote about and she was like, oh no, like it was that, it's a very classic Irish thing. Oh, mm -hmm. what are the neighbors going to think? And so she literally gave me about 10 different adjectives for this neighbor to change it to the point where he was completely unrecognizable. Like there's no way this person would recognize themselves but she still worries that he will. So yeah. yeah, that was the kind of thing. And my dad, my dad did his notes. He thought I portrayed him a bit too much of a religious knot. And he was like, I'm not that religious. And I had to be like, you are a religious. <laughs> you know, you're trained uh, to be a priest. Uh, yeah. I had the impression he, he's very religious. So I think you did good. Like he's not fanatical. I know what he means in that, but he's, mm -hmm. He, he he lives you know i think the bible and and, and christianity mm -hmm. well catholicism was a guiding map for him but no he's not a fanatical churchgoer he wouldn't be like fundamentalist and i think he thought i portrayed him too much like that and then there were points where my mom said you kind of portrayed dad a bit too much as a caricature like he he actually lends himself quite well to comedy he is just that type of eccentric person but he does also have incredible depth so there were things like that that needed to be refined but no for the most part my family were so incredibly generous and i'm very lucky that they were that they let me keep all that in yeah yes uh, you mentioned your mom was is i think also it's an important figure in the book right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i when i was reading i noticed there are two important figures besides yourself or ghost of course your mom and natasha your psychotherapist like there are two the two women of the book but i also yes. noticed they are really opposites in their way right in their personalities in, in oh, everything do yeah. you think that balance between them help you to go through through your issues like you needed that balance someone like your mom and someone like natasha that approach problems in a different way you you think that was necessary for you that's a really interesting question and yeah they're so different they my, mm -hmm. my mom still doesn't really understand natasha's approach you know and she did have that disapproval uh, when we i i honestly i didn't i don't either i think i'm mo i'm more on your <laughs> side but but it worked okay. for you so so if it worked for you i mean it, it's great uh, I, yeah. I uh, le le let me say one small thing, and you can answer. When you were describing Natasha, I imagined her exactly like Trelawney, Professor Trelawney from the Harry Potter books. But I'm oh, no, not sure it was that the idea. No, no, she's not like Trelawney. No, okay. Trelawney's very like strange, isn't she? And yes. um, very eccentric. No, okay. Natasha's very glamorous. She's more okay. like an angel goddess type. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> funny, that's funny. It's interesting to hear other people's perceptions. Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. Like they, I, I needed both. You know, I'm very much like my mom, very sensitive and introspective and all that. But um, it you know, Natasha was a real breath of fresh air that she was loud and confident and expressive and freed me from all this stuff um kind of cultural conditioning that i had and yeah she's she's yeah they were they were both they're both incredibly strong women in different ways um and natasha actually there's i don't know i don't think i put it in the book but there was oh i, I think i put it at the end where my dad said of my mom like kind, kind of trying to trying to reason with all the medical professionals trying mm -hmm. to show that i was a creative person and she stood up to the doctors that way so he, he, like i think it, it's more just about female strength that that was what i needed i needed different types of it and uh and women who use their strength in different ways i get again at the end of the book i do talk about like how um my mom's dream was to just have children she wants to have babies she wants to be a mother and a wife and that like that was her big noble dream that she needed to heal herself for and it's so different to mine which is about acting and being public and i have no interest in kids all that kind of thing but they're they're equally strong powerful and creative dreams so um i think it would like that that's more the master of the book and that's more what helped me 
being surrounded by strong, creative women who pursued their dreams over their, you know, disorders, their negative voices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a good answer. Uh, moving into the Harry Potter a bit, uh, there is a really important moment in the book. It's when you are reading The Order of the Phoenix in the hospital and yeah. you discover Luna for the first time, right? And you get yeah. like inspired by her, not only because you reflect on, on her, but also because she had some aspect that you want to be like her, right? Like there, there were some things that, that inspire you. I wonder, do you think this book can have the same effect on some readers that are looking for someone to get inspired? Uh, I really hope so. I really hope so. I would love that. Um, and yeah, that, that it's, that's a feeling I connected to a lot when, when writing the book. Um, the feeling of what, the, what these women give me, women like Natasha, like my mom, like J.K. Rowling, like Luna, um, this feeling of ha, like excitement about the world, all oh, wanting to pursue dreams and just go out there and, and, and explore the world. That's the one, the feeling I want to give them. And be, uh, because that's the feeling those people gave me. And, and that was healing more than anything else. It was, um, yeah, that gave me a sense of purpose and, and, a, and a determination to let what well, like, or, or maybe, yeah, to let go of the addiction and sort of comfort coping mechanisms that I had in place, like the coping mechanism being the eating disorder. Every time I would spend time with women like that, or just people like that, creative people, um, so it doesn't need to be kind of uh, confined to women because it wasn't. You know, my my drama teacher in the book, Marcus, he was one mm. of those people. I'd be around those people, and, and it would give me courage to um, to create and dream and all that. And and so, yeah, that's what I hope the book gives people. That's what Luna gave for me, definitely, and that's what many other creative people have given to me yeah and then you talk in the book about your transition from a big fan into the official family of harry potter mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder the, does this transition change the the ways you saw the franchise like now i'm part of this family did you start watching the movies in a different way read the books in a different way um i don't i don't watch the movies I, like it, yeah, it, it is different to me. Um, they're not as they're yeah, because I I know the people now and I know yeah. that I know their humanity and and I like that. I I found that out. Um, but yeah, it's not. I think I, I used to do that classic thing of putting those people on on pedestals and thinking mm -hmm. that they were blessed or that they were just superior. And I don't think that's a good empowering narrative to have it's kind of maybe nice and comfortable to have idols. You know, it's like, it is that childlike thing of wanting to believe in fantasies. But um, I don't think it's good to do that with, with humans because all humans are flawed and they're not perfect and we're all going to disagree. And, and, and yeah, no, we, have to, we have to be, you know, independent, self-actualized oh. people. Yeah. Yes. So, um, but the books are untouched for me, absolutely okay. untouched. Whenever I read them, like I don't see me as Luna. I don't see the other cast. Maybe there's a few cast members whose faces fit the mm -hmm. characters for me, like Alan Rickman, Snape. I, mm -hmm. I pretty much see him as Snape. Robbie Coltrane as Hagrid, I would see him. I would see their faces, but um, most of the characters, no, they're my original idea. Uh, and and when, you, when you read The Deadly Hallows, the last book, were you thinking I will have to play out this part or, or not? You enjoy it as a fan. Um, because you, you were already cast when it came out. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to go back to thinking about it. Oh, I mean, I read that in such a sleep haze. I did that mm -hmm. classic fan girl thing of trying mm -hmm. to marathon the book. Um, <laughs> I, I was probably, I was more thinking, what was I thinking? about Luna's stuff, I was thinking, thanks, Joe, you know, <laughs> when she gave, when she gave her the diadem, mm -hmm. you know, the whole bringing Harry to that horcrux, mm -hmm. I remember thinking, oh, wow, that's so nice of you to do. <laughs> but um, I was also looking out for, because I, I had, Joe had told me that 
uh, Ralph Scamander was originally in the book. And I think mm -hmm. he, I don't know for sure, I think he was supposed to have delivered them the information that Xenophilius ended up giving in the book. Um, so I was just fascinated because she had been saying, oh, he's out now, he's in again, he's out, he's in. And um, it turned out that he he was out, he never made it into the book. So I was just curious reading the Xenophilius chapter um, to read that and be like, I, I suppose more as a writer, as a storyteller, to be like, that's interesting how that how that unfolded. Um, but, but yeah, but also like uh, Luna's part, to me, playing Luna is very easy. She's just such a, a, a calm, relaxed, self-accepting character that I never would feel stressed by anything. But yeah, I was very excited to see that she had the diadem. And I was like, please put it in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about, about that you still imagine Alan Rickman as a Snape, uh, did you know, I don't know if you are aware, but Rowley said in an interview uh, that you were the only exception of an actor affecting how she imagines a character. Like after you you were cast, she writes Luna and hears your voice. I don't know if you yeah. were aware of that. Of course but, I heard that. That's the best quote uh, anyone has said how, about how, me. How does it make you feel? I mean, you're, you are excited, oh, proud of that. Me. Of course, <laughs> that's the most humbling thing. Like that is the ultimate compliment to uh -huh. have somehow infiltrated the mind of one of the most incredible writers in mm -hmm. the world in history, in my opinion, yeah. Yeah. infiltrated her mind and influenced her, even yeah. a slight, that's incredible. Um, yeah, I can die happy. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, and you are the only one. I mean, it's not that there are many and you are one of them. Yeah. You are the only one that, that made it's that. Weird, yeah, yeah it's, it's very, it's crazy. It's crazy. You, but it, I, it's funny also, cause like, I wonder, is it partly because of um, the fact that me playing Luna made Luna Irish? You know, it hadn't been mentioned mm. in the book. Because I don't know if you had this, I wonder if it's the same for you from, you know, being from Argentina, but when I read the books, I didn't, I was what, nine, no, eight, I was eight. And I think at that age, you're so not, especially the internet wasn't as present. Mm -hmm. You're so not aware of the whole rest yes. of the world, all the mm -hmm. cultures. I remember as a child thinking, oh, my accent is normal. Everyone else has an accent. I have a normal accent. Mm -hmm. And so because the Harry Potter characters felt so close, I loved them, I felt they were friends. They also had normal, normal accents too. Mm -hmm. So in my head, they were all, they all sounded like me. And it was only when the films came out that I was like, oh, these are English mm -hmm. people, that's <laughs> different. But I still think because Luna felt, yeah, so close to me, I don't mean similar to me, but as in she was precious to me, I could never imagine her with an English accent. Um, but I assume J.K. Rowling did, because you know, that's her normal. Um, so sometimes I'm like, I wonder, was it that? I wonder, was it? But again, but, to me, Luna's soul, it, it feels like Irish. It has that magical um, mm -hmm. mysticism that the, uh, the Irish culture has. Yeah. But, but I mean, we can take that if she says she hears your voice, it means Luna speaks as an Irish. So we can say Luna <laughs> is Irish. I mean, it's canon. For we that we specialize about <laughs> canon, I can take it as canon. That would so, be super cool. Yes. So definitely, definitely win for Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And of course, you talk about the sign book, but you have two sign books. One, one by her and one by David Yates that he gave you mm -hmm. after the casting. I, I guess you mm -hmm. keep both of them, right? They are to your treasures. Yes. Yes. I definitely. They're my treasures. Um, yeah. I suppose the Order of the Phoenix is more mm -hmm. of a special one mm -hmm. because it was, it was just it was a sticker by Bloomsbury that so she mm -hmm. obviously signed. Yes. But yeah, again, like I was saying in the book, it was just this tangible connection mm -hmm. to this person who felt like she might be a fantasy, she might be made up. And um it, it really made me believe, oh, there's that if there's that connection, if I can connect to her, if I can touch this book that she this <laughs> this um sticker that she's touched then what else can i touch what else can i get into in that world um but yeah and then the, the david yates i mean that that was funny because it was like it was just such a harmless little sweet message he was just trying to say but i took it so badly i was like oh he's casting me out of his life forever and he obviously thinks i'm not a true fan because he's given me another copy of order of the phoenix i already have three of those mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, i just over overthought the whole thing uh, uh, um Sorry, do, do you remember the first time you met Rowling? Because that's not in the book, and I was super like uh, excited to read about that. And um, <laughs> do, uh, do I remember I everything. Of course, I'll never forget that moment. 
it was so magical. Um, I was in the makeup room in, in, you know, we were filming Order of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. We'd been a few weeks into filming, maybe even a couple months, actually. I was in the makeup chair and I was already having a pretty surreal moment because Tom Felton had come over to me and asked me to sign a book. And that was the first autograph I'd ever done. So it was like, hang on, what? Tom wants me to sign my name on this Harry Potter book. Everything feels wrong here. And so I was busy with that. And then the producers, the two Davids, David Hame and David Barron walked in and I was vaguely aware that there was this other person. Um, but when they walk in together, it's like, it's important. You know, you pay attention, you look up. It's like, oh, right, okay, we all have to turn our attention to this thing. So I looked up when they came in, but I was just looking at them. And they were all looking at me. They weren't saying anything. They were just like looking at me expectantly. And I was waiting for them to say something. And then I looked between them at the woman, Jo. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I couldn't clock it for a few minutes. I kind of just looked at her because she's like, she's little you know she's small and petite mm -hmm. and a, a beautiful lady and and i don't know it's just like too much too weird to imagine that this whole world all the books our jobs this film set has all come from like somewhere in her mind that is like a type of magic so i just I just kind of stared at her for a bit really <laughs> freaked out and then i had a little freak out kind of jumped up and hugged her and yeah. Uh, uh, and did, did she recognize you from the letters at that time? She, did she, was, she know that it was you, the one who sent her? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So ah, okay. she, she had already been told. So we okay. had been for three years. And then she had been sent the cast list. I didn't tell her because I was too nervous to tell her. She'd been sent the cast list. She recognized my name. She checked ah. that it was the same person with my address. And then she wrote me a letter saying, you know, she was so excited. And she did say in that letter, I'm going to come and see you on set. I can't wait to see. But she didn't say when. So, yeah, she knew me. She knew all the history was there. Mm -hmm. yeah, was nice, special. nice memory. Uh, to wrap it up, this Harry Potter section and then going back to the book uh, briefly, I want to ask you, is that true that you ask David Heyman why he didn't include Dumbledore's funeral in the half Red Prince movie? It's true. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, di I did because um, oh, it just felt like, well, that scene was beautiful with the mm -hmm. mermaids and the centaurs. I just loved that. Like, it just showed who he was. He was some a, a, a person who united all, all races, all species, uh, everyone. He brings everyone together despite their differences. You know, um, despite the separate communities they all live in and and i mean the death of dumbledore truly affected me deeply i i cried i know this sounds bad i wasn't very close to my grandparents i honestly cried way more over dumbledore than any of my grandparents because i he felt like uh, such an important person <clears throat> and i just had that sense we've been trained for it for five books six books that every time dumbledore comes into the room you're safe, you know. Mm -hmm. He will vanquish whoever it is. He will explain Harry what to, to explain to Harry what's happening and why everything's happening at this point. So that that being pulled up, it was like, oh my God, what is the world? What is life? What do we do without Dumbledore? It was very it was important to me. And he is, other than Luna, he's like my next favorite character. So yeah, I remember when I saw it was cut out of the script, I went to David Aim and I was like, What what are you doing? Why why can't you? And I remember like he was like, oh, no, it's it's a budget thing. We just we just can't make it work. And I was like, well, why don't you just we can take some of my <laughs> you can take, if you need to budget, I'll help. And he was like, yeah, that wouldn't even pay for it. So <laughs> I think <laughs> Let's do a Kickstarter so fans can can put some money and, and we can all That's uh, a Kickstarter, a crowdfunding. Kickstarter, so, yeah. so the fans yeah. can, can do it. But yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't, I don't know that we don't really appreciate how much those things cost, like no. to have a whole, to have the whole cast. I mean, Mark Williams used to make that joke. He'd look around when we were doing the Battle of Hogwarts and be like, this is the most expensive set of extras I've ever been on. Because like, essentially, Maggie Smith, uh, Helena Bonham Carter, well, not Helena, but Maggie Smith, uh, you know, Mark Williams, all these people were, were being paid to be extras. To <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I think bringing all those people together for his funeral, all the special effects for the mermaids, the centaurs, I think it was like they just couldn't do it. And mm -hmm. they were probably more gearing up for like film seven. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the best choice though, because these films, you know, like they are, they're going to last forever. And mm -hmm. I think it would have been really special. God, could we not just have just pushed the boat out a little bit more and, and got the Dumbledore funeral? Mm -hmm. I wish. <laughs> maybe maybe in a remake, you know, maybe in a maybe. yes, TV series, something like that. So going back to the book and to close the interview, uh, again, it's very well written. I, I really enjoy it. Do you have any plans to write more books, maybe fiction, a novel, maybe nonfiction? Yeah, definitely. Definitely fiction is next. I never want to write nonfiction again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done with that. I, I think I've like put my family through enough. Um, but I also like this was this is my story. My story is complete as in my mental health story. I think I'm going to um, I, I don't really want to be a mental health advocate and I don't want to keep talking about eating disorders. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm an artist and, you know, I'm a creative that that's where the book ends with pursuing creativity. So, um, of course, on some level, I'll always have to struggle with my own things privately, but I think like I've chosen this creative path now and that's what I want to be. I want to be a storyteller. I want to be a writer. So, um, yeah, the next one is hopefully fiction. I would really love to write a fairy tale. That's sort of my plan. I'm sort of a bit like, oh, is that too big of a leap to make between nonfiction? I think maybe I should just do fiction and root it in the real world and maybe then the fairy tale next. But yeah, that's my plan. I, I think, really, honestly, you are a really good author. So I'm I'm waiting for your next book. And for mm -hmm. all the people around the world, do you know if there are any plans to get it translated into Spanish, yeah. French? Okay. You, can you tell yeah. anything or not yet? Maybe not. Maybe we probably need to... can't. I know I signed a contract with a Russian publisher, so nice. that's good. I think we're in talks with a Portuguese uh, publisher, so the Portuguese, Russian and Portuguese will probably be first. Um, I think that's all I can share at the moment. Sure. But yeah, things are but, like but, trickling. Yes, that's that's great. I mean, Harry Potter has fans around the world. You have fans yeah. around the world, so well, I think. Know, every time I go to South America, anytime mm -hmm. I've been, it's like another level of celebrity. Mm -hmm. I'm like, guys, I'm not that famous, but <laughs> you it's are like they're, they're fanatical. The uh, Harry Potter fanatical in South America, so yes. hopefully we can get Spanish translation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and I mean, we are the generation now that we are adults now. So we start reading this type of book. So yeah, I think yeah. I think getting translated will be good news for, for everyone. Yeah. Thank so you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, honestly. Uh, I really appreciate it. Lovely, intelligent questions. You clearly you. really appreciate books and writing. So it's really nice to talk about that. Thank you for that. And um, and for yeah. sharing your collection with me. I love that you're <laughs> yes. I see the strike books in the corner. I'm a big fan yes, of those. Yes, yes, here. Yes, the strike books. Uh, a Hagrid with my, sorry, with my favorite football team, Chelsea. So, oh. <laughs> yes. Again, and here I have translation, Harry Potter books. Yeah, all of Rowling. Everything else. Like a snapshot of who you are. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. This is my corner. <laughs> yeah, love it. So, thank, you. thank you again. It's Hasmina Shoy. Congratulations again on your book. And for everyone else, remember the opposite of butterfly hunting is already out in Ireland, the United Kingdom, the United States. If you are everyone else in the world, you can get it online. It has an ebook version. It has an audiobook version read by Ivana. It's great. I, I listened to some bits, so it's, it's great from her own voice. And you can also follow Ivana on Instagram. Ivana Lynch is her handle. So do it. And yes, thank you very much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye. Thank you.